Hello everyone and welcome to We Are Goche web, uh, webinar series. The International Goche Day 2020 is on the 1st of October. This important day uh, of the year is an opportunity to raise awareness about Goche disease and to give prominence to the global Goche community. Centogene is organizing different webinars to celebrate this day. And today we have the presence of Professor Atul Mehta, who is talking about overcoming diagnostic challenges in Gaucher disease. We will discuss the following topics. Case history, impact of the delay, who is affected, delay in Gaucher diagnosis, the root of the problem, and a strategy to reduce problems. Professor Atul Mehta was consultant hematologist and professor of hematology at the Royal Free at the University College Hospital in London until his retirement in January 2019. He, runs, uh, he ran the General Laboratory Hematology and Diagnostic Service for many years at the Royal Free. He was the founder and director of the Lysosomal Story Disorder Centers at the Royal Free, which grew to be the largest center in the uh, United Kingdom. He now works in private practice, including consultant. If you have any question, please enter them into the Q and A chat, and we will refer back to them at the end of the presentation. So now, Professor Meta, whenever you want, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordi. And thank you to Centergene for inviting me to talk to you today about uh, Gaucher disease. And the title of my talk that I've chosen is Pathways to Diagnosis. And as Georgie has explained, I want to give some illustrative case histories, the sort of patient that many of you physicians uh, may well have come across. And I want to explore why it is that there is a delay in diagnosing Gaucher. And as Georgie has explained, perhaps if we can raise awareness, we can then explore strategies for reducing this delay. Here's my first case. And uh, this is a typical patient uh, who may present to a hematologist, uh, a, a male. Um, could equally be a female, uh, but hematologic malignancies like hairy cell leukemia, lymphoma, uh, they are slightly commoner in males. And I say male uh, because I can think of at least three or four males who have presented to me in this way with splenomegaly. Uh, the patient reports discomfort in the left upper abdomen and has a easily palpable spleen. The presence or absence of lymph nodes is crucial in this setting. Of course, most hematologic malignancies presenting with splenomegaly, there will be lymph node enlargement and the absence of lymph node enlargement, uh, well, it led me to diagnose hairy cell leukemia in this particular individual um, because that's a, a hematologic malignancy that often presents in males with splenomegaly and no lymph node enlargement. But equally, I've had patients referred to me with a putative diagnosis of lymphoma uh, because they have hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. The blood count you see there, typical, it's pancytopenia. All three elements of mature blood are reduced. The red cells are down and that patient is marginally anemic, not hugely anemic. And that's interesting because we always think of anemia in Gaucher. In fact, the thrombocytopenia is more pronounced, the normal platelet count would be 150, um, platelet count of 55, a low white count indicative of the enlarged spleen. And the abdominal CT confirmed the enlarged spleen. And what does a hematologist do in these circumstances? He looks at the blood film, yes, and then he will do a bone marrow and this is what one finds in Gaucher. Uh, the high power picture on the left is the so-called 
Gaucher cell. That's a macrophage, which is full, it's engorged with, li with, with lipid. And we talk about a tissue paper appearance of the cytoplasm of that engorged macrophage. Uh, it has engorged uh, uh, lipid, uh, but it can't digest it because it lacks the enzymatic machinery to digest glycolipids. And so these glycolipids accumulate within the macrophage. And on the right hand side is a bone marrow trephine biopsy. This is normal bone marrow, megakaryocytes, and a mixture of normal hemopoietic cells, uh, a piece of bone here. This is all abnormal on the right hand side of this bone marrow trephine biopsy. This is completely abnormal, homogeneous macrophage tissue, engorged macrophages, Gaucher cells. And the differential diagnosis of an enlarged spleen, well, uh, I guess it's hematologists and hepatologists are the two important groups of physicians who see this. And certainly where I worked in the Royal Free Hospital, we have a very uh, distinguished group of liver physicians working with us. You'll have heard of Professor Dame Sheila Sherlock, who founded the liver unit at the Royal Free. So we have many patients with an enlarged spleen. And if you saw such a thing at the role free, you'd either think of liver disease or you'd think of hematologic malignancy. Uh, but I'm aware that there's a very wide and important differential diagnosis of splenomegaly infections, malaria, bacterial endocarditis, virus infections, inflammatory diseases, circulatory conditions, and storage, storage, abnormal storage, such as in the lysosomal storage disorders, such as in a condition such as amyloid, uh, again, something we see quite a lot of at the Royal Free Hospital because we have a referral unit for amyloidosis. But those are the various things you'd think about if you see somebody with an enlarged spleen. And I would ask you to consider Gaucher in your differential diagnosis but obviously you're not going to jump to put Gaucher at the top. What will be the various things that you'll look for in association with an enlarged spleen? And that's what I want to spend the next few minutes exploring. One of the things is the size of the spleen. I mean, look at that one there. The normal spleen is 250 grams, about the size of a baseball or a, or a large baseball, a cricket ball for those who have had any association with the British Empire, you'll think of a cricket ball. That spleen there is much bigger than a rugby ball. In fact, it's, it's a, it has a volume of perhaps three to four litres. It's huge. And certainly if one encounters such a large spleen, Gaucher disease would be one of the things to think about. Uh, the classic list includes malaria, it includes myelofibrosis, it includes uh, lymphoma. Those are causes of a massive spleen. But if you see a massive spleen, think of Gaucher because uh, bacterial endocarditis or glandular fever or even portal hypertension is unlikely to give you a spleen of three, four liters, uh, perhaps 40 times enlarged compared to normal. And such a big spleen will impact on the blood count in the way that is indicated in the slide. Unfortunately, many people around the world have their spleens removed in order to improve the blood count. And although the count will improve, if the storage is no longer in the spleen, then storage will occur in other parts of the body and certainly in Gaucher disease, we do not recommend splenectomy. There is the man himself, Philippe Gaucher, a Frenchman, indeed a medical student when he first made the observation, as it turned out, the mistaken observation that these macrophages in the spleen were a representation of a hematologic malignancy. He was wrong, and it wasn't until 
many years thereafter that the enzymatic defect was discovered by Roscoe Brady. Uh, it's a deficiency of a lysosomal enzyme. And that means that the lysosomes cannot degrade glucosal ceramide, which accumulates within macrophages, particularly in the bone marrow, liver, spleen. And the extent of Gaucher and the clinical features depend quite a lot on the degree of deficiency of the enzyme. So patients with type 1 Gaucher disease, they form the commonest cohort in Europe and North America, and they will be much of the subject of my talk. But I want to also emphasize uh, that on a global perspective, uh, type 3 Gaucher, which can involve the central nervous system, type 3 Gaucher is globally just as common as type 1. And there you have type 1, the main features of type 1 Gaucher disease, there is residual enzymatic activity. Uh, if there were no residual, if there was zero enzymatic activity, well, in fact, that condition is not compatible with life. Zero enzymatic activity for a housekeeping lysosomal enzyme is not compatible with life. Or if it is, then that gives rise to a type of Gaucher that we call type 2 Gaucher. Type 2 Gaucher disease is profound or profound deficiency or absent activity of the enzyme and it's incompatible with life. Type 1, there's a good level of residual activity, but not enough to prevent accumulation of the lipid uh, and you might see it in the spleen, as we've indicated here, the liver, uh, the lungs and bone. Those are the tissues that are very significantly affected by type 1 Gaucher disease, the liver, the spleen, the skeleton, possibly the lungs, the bone marrow, with reduction in activity of those organs and enlargement and infiltration of those organs. But I mentioned ophthalmoplegia, uh, which is a feature of type 3 Gaucher. If there is a further reduction in activity, then the central nervous system may be affected. And the most significant feature that I want to emphasize is the ophthalmoplegia of type 3. But type 3 Gaucher disease can lead to intellectual impairment, uh, myoclonic epilepsy, and a range of other manifestations uh, that we will touch upon. A lysosomal storage disease. Many of you will have come across this term before. The lysosomes are organelles, subcellular organelles that have an important role in phagocytosis, endocytosis and autophagy. They have a central role in cellular metabolism. And a crucial part of this role is served by lysosomal enzymes. And uh, there are many 40, 50 such enzymes. And most lysosomal disorders are the result of lack of a particular enzyme. So LSDs are a group of 50 plus inherited metabolic disorders. And several of them are commoner amongst the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Uh, Gaucher disease, yes. Uh, Tay-Sachs is another one. Neiman Pick is another one. Um, you can see many of these 50 or so disorders on that slide there. And you will see that slide depicts Gaucher as the commonest of these conditions. And uh, I'm mindful that Centrogene is a rare disease company. And these are rare diseases, individually, certainly rare. Uh, but look at that. If collectively, these account for one in five to 7,000 newborns. Now, that's, uh, that's not that rare. And we say Gaucher disease has an incidence, a prevalence of one in 59,000. Well, if your population is in, North London or 
New York or uh, Northeast England or, or Israel or anywhere where there's a large population of Ashkenazi Jewish residents, well, the carrier rate amongst the Ashkenazi Jewish population is about one in one in 10 are carriers for this condition. One in 900 will be sufferers. That's not that rare at all. And, and there you've got Fabry disease. If you go around that dial, you've got Fabry disease and the quoted prevalence in the paper there from Australia, the quoted prevalence is one in 117,000. It's an X-linked condition. So one in 117,000 males suffer from Fabry. Is that true? No, not true at all. Uh, in fact, in our experience in London, Fabry disease is commoner than Gaucher. And um, as I've indicated, these diseases might be due to complete absence of the enzyme or complete absence of the enzyme is typically for these conditions incompatible with life. Fabry is an exception, complete absence is compatible with life and complete absence might well lead to classic Fabry disease in one in 100,000 males, but less severe forms are much commoner. So there's a spectrum of lysosomal disorders for each of those. And this is the clinical spectrum of Gaucher disease. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see the headings there, type one, type two, type three, ignore type two, because that's really the infantile or the neonatal fatal form. It's untreatable. Type one is the commonest in Europe and North America. The type three is the commonest in Asia. And you'll see some of the common mutations in the gene that we that we recognize. Um, CNS involvement coming down that table. CNS involvement is not seen in type one, although they do get Parkinson's disease, which is an interesting uh, uh, new area of Gaucher disease, which perhaps we can touch on. They do get Parkinson's disease, but there is no lipid accumulation within the central nervous system. They get bone involvement, they get hepatosplenomegaly and bone marrow problems and skeletal disorders. Uh, turning across to type three, supranuclear gaze palsy, SNGP, the ophthalmoplegia is often the prominent feature, early feature of type three Gaucher disease. The key to diagnosis is to suspect the condition. If you suspect it, you are well on the way to diagnosing it. It's an enzymatic disorder, so measure the activity of the enzyme, look for the excess substrate and measure the relevant biomarker. Centogene will help you do this on these dried blood spots, perfectly adequate for making the diagnosis. And in fact, you can do DNA analysis on that dried blood spot as well. Enzymology and DNA analysis, all from the same blood spot. I would advise that you seek advice from a specialist laboratory to confirm the diagnosis and to measure biomarkers. Uh, but the key to diagnosis is to suspect the condition. And then refer on to a specialist center. This is uh, uh, the United Kingdom and uh, Northern Ireland. And you'll see the names of several distinguished academic medical centers in the United Kingdom, all of which have specialist facilities for patients with metabolic diseases, particularly these lysosomal storage disorders. And we run a very centralized service in the UK. And I would advise that you refer diagnostic material onto a specialist laboratory. And of course, Centrogene will help you do that with their dried blood spots. This is where I spent uh, nearly 40 years of my professional life in North London. And we've built up a lysosomal storage disorders unit. 
interestingly, our focus is on adults. We think of children, don't we? When we think of an inherited condition, we think of children. Well, uh, our focus was on adults. And uh, you'll see uh, that, yes, we have uh, over 100 patients attending with Gaucher disease, male and female, it's autosomal recessive. Uh, we have many more patients attending with primary disease. That's X-linked, so more females uh, than males. Um, uh, but certainly our experience is that Fabry is much commoner than Gaucher. And we have patients with the other lysosomal storage disorders, but our focus is predominantly adults. And many of these children are now growing into adulthood and transferring their care from a pediatric hospital, Great Ormond Street Hospital, into our service at the Royal Free. Why might the diagnosis be delayed? Here are some reasons. Physicians may not, may, not have, may not have heard of the condition or they may have never seen it so that they're not aware of it. Uh, these patients present with, often with very nonspecific early signs. Uh, they don't have a signature symptom. Many of these conditions do not have a signature symptom. The patient will not tell you I've got Gaucher disease, obviously, and there's no one sign that will tell you. Fatigue, bruising, features of anemia, thrombocytopenia, discomfort in the abdomen, um, uh, failure to thrive might be the feature that a parent reports with regard to a, to a child. This is data from our own centre. These were the features presenting to our own centre. Now, we are haematologists and haematologists have a central role in making this diagnosis. Let me be quite clear about that. Um, haematologists are the specialty that around the world sees Gaucher disease. Uh, and the only other specialty really of note would be paediatricians because of the prevalence of type 3 Gaucher, particularly, as I've said, outside Europe and North America. But those there are the symptoms and signs at diagnosis that we particularly saw in a study we performed. Alison Thomas was the lead author of the Royal Free Study, some published 2009, I think. Bruising, epistaxis, splenomegaly, bone pain. But there was a significant interval between the first symptom and diagnosis in our cohort. And the same, sadly, is seen around the world. Look at that a study from France looking at 500 patients. That's the French registry. Mean time between clinical onset and diagnosis, 5.7 years. Seven years median, seven years median in Romania, 11 years in the USA. I'll say a bit more about that. Some data from Spain that the time interval between onset of symptoms and diagnosis might be coming down. That's, in, that's encouraging. Here's a, another case, uh, a, a young girl with hip pain, bone pain difficulty in walking, fever, elevated white cell count, suggesting inflammation. An MRI is undertaken, widening of the left hip with edema. You can see some of the changes. You can see the shaft of the femur is abnormal. And you can see that the head of the fever is abnormal. There's edema. This is clearly an abnormal MRI scan with infarction in the left femoral head. Uh, that can lead to avascular necrosis in the absence of a diagnosis and in the absence of appropriate treatment. In fact, this child was misdiagnosed as having osteomyelitis and indeed treated with intravenous antibiotics. It was many years later that the correct diagnosis was made when the child, well, the young adult presented with 
thrombocytopenia to a hematologist and this earlier history became apparent. So which are the specialties to which these patients present? Uh, this is data from an expert review that we conducted with Gaucher physicians from around the world. Um, and we had input from patients. And you can see there the specialties that are most likely to be referred to these uh, patients are hematologists or heme oncologists, pediatricians. These patients will present to primary care physicians, internists, general physicians, hepatologists, and gastroenterologists, I will emphasize. Geneticists, of course, I will emphasize. Orthopedic surgeons, rheumatologists, I will emphasize because of the bone disease. Neurologists, I will emphasize because of Parkinson's disease. And which are the groups of physicians who are the, uh, refer the patients onto the Gaucher disease centers? Again, it's the same groups of physicians who refer these patients on uh, to the centers, uh, except that some of them are self-referred. And of course, you see patients through screening programs and through pedigree analysis very much the important thing in parts of the country, parts of the world where consanguinity is an issue. Um, and we see that amongst uh, communities where consanguinity is an issue. It's autosomal recessive. Um, whereas in Fabry, which is X-linked, pedigree analysis will easily yield additional affected individuals. In Gaucher disease, you're unlikely to see it in siblings. Of course, one in four siblings will be affected, so you must take a family history. Uh, but with family size in the West generally being small, you're not going to see it. In some communities, you will have larger families, and it is important to take a family history. But don't expect to find affected family members in an autosomal recessive condition. Uh, but of course, for an X-linked condition, yes, you will see family members affected, particularly if there is consanguinity. So remember to take a family history. These are inherited conditions. And the main cause of diagnostic delay in the expert centers that we surveyed, again, it's mostly around lack of awareness, often a misdiagnosis, be, each of which means that there's a delay, and it's that delay that can have significant consequences. Here's some data from the United States. Um, Prime Mystery, now at Yale, uh, but formerly a colleague of mine at the Royal Free Hospital, uh, soon after Pram arrived in the US, he organized a survey of American hemato-oncologists and their questionnaire survey was posted out to over 400 hematologists and oncologists in the USA, a survey wherein was described an absolutely typical presentation of Gaucher disease and the physicians were asked for a differential diagnosis and only one in five, only 20% even considered Gaucher. And in subsequent studies from the US, the mean time to diagnosis was 48 months. It was 11 years in another study from the US. I've already said uh, that amongst patients seen at our own center, diagnostic delay was frequently observed. And we know the population frequency in the UK amongst Ashkenazi Jewish community, we would predict that there should be perhaps three to 400 affected individuals within the Jewish community in the UK. And how many have been diagnosed? Around 100 to 150 of the expected three to 400 Gaucher patients in the Jewish community have been diagnosed. 
So you can see that even when there's a high level of prevalence of this condition, there's work to be done in diagnosing them and preventing complications. This is a study from the Gaucher Registry, and it's looking at how often avascular necrosis is detected. And the finding was that the prevalence of avascular necrosis is related to the time interval between the first symptom and diagnosis. If the time interval between the first symptom and diagnosis was less than two years, then the likelihood of developing avascular necrosis was significantly less than if the diagnosis had been delayed because these complications are preventable by appropriate treatment. And such treatment might be enzyme replacement therapy, such treatment might be substrate reduction therapy. And of course, now there are other treatment approaches, uh, including very substantial, interesting gene therapy. But my purpose today is not to talk about treatment. It's to try and encourage you to consider this condition and reduce the delay between onset of symptoms and diagnosis and thereby reduce the potential impact of this delay. The impact which might include bone fracture, might include irreversible liver disease, might include bone marrow disturbance leading to bleeding, sepsis, might lead to growth retardation in children and might lead to the performance of an inappropriate procedure such as a splenectomy or a liver biopsy. Look at this case. This is a lady currently attending the Royal Free Hospital, presented in 2012, age of 34, generally well, generally well, very, very minor degree of anemia, went to her GP who measured her iron status, surprisingly found the serum ferritin, that's a measure of body iron. The GP was expecting it to be low. In fact, it was high. She didn't drink alcohol, which is a very common cause of a raised ferritin, perhaps causing liver disease. Um, in the UK, we see a lot of patients with hemochromatosis, and the GP was aware of this. There was no family history of hemochromatosis, and physical examination was... Uh, unremarkable. In retrospect, the spleen tip was palpable, actually. The GP didn't uh, detect that, but the patient was sent up to a hematologist. Moderate anemia, but that wasn't so much the problem. Actually, a slight reduction in white cells and platelets, but it's that serum ferritin. The serum ferritin should be less than 200, and hers was 640 repeated. And you can see that the transferrin, that's the carriage protein of iron, that is fully saturated. A transferrin saturation above 55% or above 50% is indicative of significant iron overload. And the hematologist considered that this might be due to hemochromatosis. And the hematologist arranged analysis of the common mutations that underlie hemochromatosis and found that she was heterozygous for the common mutations. And we know that that does not lead to iron overload. So hemochromatosis was not the explanation for the raised serum ferritin. And the hematologist considered uh, that uh, liver disease might be a possible explanation and referred the patient on to a hepatologist who promptly did what liver physicians do and a liver biopsy was performed and rather circuitous route but there it is 
the liver biopsy shows infiltration by lipid laden macrophages and a diagnosis of Gaucher disease became evident and the patient was promptly referred back to the haematologist who sent her on to us and as she's very well she's on treatment with uh, uh, appropriate measures and her type 1 Gaucher disease is very easily managed and she's very well but the cause of the raised serum ferritin in this case was Gaucher disease. Those are some of the other conditions that you would think about when you see somebody with a raised serum ferritin. You would consider liver disease, you would consider inflammation, you'd consider alcohol, uh, you consider hemochromatosis. And if the HFE gene mutation is negative, increasingly we think of looking for other genetic changes that can underline our iron overload. But I would encourage you not to forget that Gaucher disease is one of those conditions where iron metabolism is disturbed and it can present with a raised serum ferritin. So it's the, con it's, it's the constellation of abnormalities that I want to emphasize. And I was telling you that we got a group of experts together in London a few years ago, and we came up with a consensus, a so-called Delphi consensus, and we came up with major signs and minor signs. We're trying to think of, can, of signs and symptoms which should prompt physicians to test patients for Gaucher. What are the major signs that you need? They're listed there, splenomegaly thrombocytopenia are two I've emphasized, bone issues, that's another one that I've emphasized, and elevated serum ferritin, that's another one that I've emphasized from a hematologic perspective. Um, monoclonal or polyclonal gammopathy is frequently seen in Gaucher patients. Uh, the bone issues could be bone pain, it could be avascular necrosis, it could be a pathological fracture, hepatomegaly, most patients, most adults with Gaucher disease, in fact, have a history of gallstones. They may have a history of bruising, bleeding. They may have osteoporosis. As children, they will have had growth retardation. They may have supranuclear gaze palsy. And they may have some biochemical abnormalities. We listed those as minor signs. Don't forget the importance of family history. Don't forget the importance of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, but those were some of the major signs and the less frequent signs that we identified. And I'm emphasizing type three Gaucher disease. And I'm emphasizing that type three Gaucher disease, there is a, re a marked reduction in enzymatic activity such that the central nervous system will be affected and it's going to be eye movements that are particularly a feature uh, but myoclonic epilepsy may be a feature in type 3 Gaucher and it's the presence of more than one of these abnormalities particularly if there are then some minor features as well. So perhaps what we should be thinking of doing is introducing some sort of a scoring system and this is a this is a more recent uh, paper from this uh, study and here we're introducing a weighting we're introducing a scoring system so splenomegaly we'd say that's very important you really should think about Gaucher disease if you don't have a clear explanation for splenomegaly and if you're a hematologist or a gastroenterologist, you'll be seeing patients with splenomegaly quite frequently. Thrombocytopenia, an important feature, and we're giving two points for that. But have a look, plate account of 50 to 140, yes, mild thrombocytopenia. Surely severe thrombocytopenia should also make you think of Gaucher disease. Well, you should think about it, but it's not a, not a particular feature. It's much more a feature of immune thrombocytopenia or various other 
hematologic causes cause severe thrombocytopenia, but mild thrombocytopenia, yes, that's what you see in Gaucher. And in fact, mild thrombocytopenia, often with bleeding, because most people with a platelet count of 70, they don't bleed because platelet function is usually normal. But if you have Gaucher, you could well have a platelet count of 70 with bruising because platelet function is abnormal, because coagulation is often abnormal. And if you've got hyperferritinemia with mild anemia, mild thrombocytopenia and splenomegaly, Gaucher disease is very much on the horizon there, particularly if there's a gammopathy. So it's the constellation of these abnormalities. And when we came up with this scoring system, we wanted to validate it. And uh, how did we do that? Well, we chose four cohorts of patients, 25 each, and we scored the cohorts. The first cohort had Gaucher disease. We looked at 25 consecutive patients with Gaucher disease, scored them, sure enough, um, this was a good way of diagnosing Gaucher. We looked at 25 consecutive patients with immune thrombocytopenia, 25 consecutive patients with lymphoma, hematologic malignancy, 25 consecutive patients with chronic liver disease. And we scored them. And what did we find? Well, here are the scores in the Gaucher patients. You can see that, yes, uh, uh, the features that I've emphasized, splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, mild anemia, hyperferritinemia, uh, Jewish ancestry, those were all very typical of the Gaucher cohort. Uh, they were not typical at all of immune thrombocytopenia. Interestingly, hematologic malignancy, well, you don't get the same constellation of abnormalities. In fact, the cohort that were most similar to the Gaucher patients with those with chronic liver disease. So this is causing me to shift my emphasis a little. We've always gone to hematologists and said, look, you must have Gaucher patients lurking in your clinics. They do, but I would now look towards my colleagues in hepatology. Hey, have you got patients with splenomegaly, hyperferritinemia, Jewish ancestry? gallstones, Parkinson's disease, maybe a family history of Parkinson's disease, uh, bruising and bleeding, which is more significant than the level of thrombocytopenia, a spleen size that's bigger than you would expect from the level of portal hypertension. It's obvious, isn't it? Once you've made the diagnosis, once you've made the observation, it's absolutely obvious. It's staring you in the face. So it's not as rare as you think. You may have seen it. You may have diagnosed it. You may have missed it. We reckon there are many sufferers in the UK who are not yet diagnosed. And uh, that's true around the world. Typically, they will see a hematologist or a pediatrician, but they may see a gastroenterologist, they may see a geneticist, they may see an orthopedic surgeon or a rheumatologist. Do try and think about it, because if there is a delay in diagnosis, uh, your patients could be suffering complications which are preventable, and they may have family members who are susceptible to this condition, and there are effective treatments. I'll end by extending acknowledgement to several colleagues, current and past, who helped me with this presentation. And uh, Geordie, we're very happy to take questions, aren't we? Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Professor um, Adun Mehta for sharing your experience. So let's move on to the question and answer part of the webinar. So we have um, the, fir uh, the first question is regarding uh, the clinical profile or what do you think is the clinical profile of un undiagnosed Gaucher patients uh, currently here in, in Europe? 
Well, I think that um, in Europe, we're mostly going to be seeing patients with type 1, Gaucher, and the clinical profile of these patients will be, uh, some may be asymptomatic, because those patients with uh, the milder forms of type 1 Gaucher disease, particularly that one sees in the Jewish community, they may be asymptomatic, and we've diagnosed patients in their 70s and 80s with very few symptoms, um, but they may well have splenomegaly, uh, they may well have bone pain, and they may well have changes in their blood picture with thrombocytopenia, bruising, bleeding, leukopenia, mild levels of anemia. For reasons that are not well understood, I've, I've mentioned some complications of Gaucher disease, which could be the presenting feature. Uh, hematologic malignancy, there's an increased incidence of multiple myeloma. There's an increased incidence of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, disorders of the immune, immune system frequently seen in Gaucher. I've mentioned Parkinson's disease, and we do not clearly understand the links between these. Parkinson's disease, of course, is not inherited, is it? Well, in the majority of patients, it isn't, but there are genes underlying Parkinson's. And in fact, surprisingly, the commonest, the, the commonest genetic abnormality in Parkinson's is heterozygosity for mutations at the Gaucher locus, at the glucose rubricidase locus. And I say heterozygosity, yes, carriers of Gaucher disease seem to be almost as susceptible to developing Parkinson's as sufferers of Gaucher disease. So that truly is intriguing. And it's throwing up a very interesting area of research into why uh, a misfolded molecules, proteins, misfolded proteins as they travel through the endoplasmic reticulum, how they could cause stress within the cytoplasm and disturb the function of other molecules and how that may relate to the development of Parkinson's, but possibly the development of other, some of the other complications of Gaucher disease. It's a, it's a truly fascinating condition. Okay, um, the, the second question is, uh, how can we use the biomarkers in clinical practice for early diagnosis of lysosomal stress disorder or Gaucher disease? I think that's a, that's a key question. Uh, having made a diagnosis of Gaucher and prior to treatment, it's important to establish the, the extent of the condition. And we're fortunate in Gaucher disease to have a very reliable biomarker. Um, it's related to the substrate, and that's exactly as you would expect, that it's an enzymatic deficiency. So the level of the substrate should be raised. It is the substrate. Is, uh, uh, is, is raised, but it's the lysoderivative of the substrate, lysoGB1, which is way the more reliable biomarker. So I would very much suggest uh, that you measure the lysoGB1 prior to intervening with uh, uh, specific treatment. There are a range of other biomarkers available for Gaucher. I mean, I've mentioned the serum ferritin, not a terribly reliable biomarker, but as soon as you start treating Gaucher, the serum ferritin begins to fall. There's another one called chytotriacidase that many of us have used over the years. It's a macrophage-derived enzyme, and its level is raised in the majority of patients with Gaucher disease. But now we have a specific biomarker. And in many of the lysosomal storage disorders, Yes, there are important advances in treatment, but it's not so easy to monitor the progress of the patient because most of these other conditions don't have reliable biomarkers. But Gaucher, we have one, and it's a very useful thing to do to monitor the level. Thank you so much. Another question from the audience is, could you kindly explain some more about liver disease mimicking Gaucher disease, uh, type one, especially in reference to pediatric? Yes, well, uh, lysosomal storage disorders typically don't affect the liver. 
Um, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm trying to think of what conditions you're going to see presenting to a pediatrician with, with, with liver disease. Um, um, I think it's going to be more in adults. I think a child with Gaucher, uh, they're going to present with splenomegaly. You do get visceral involvement in Gaucher disease in type 3 Gaucher disease, I've said that you'll have neurologic manifestations with ophthalmoplegia, uh, but I've emphasized that they do have visceral manifestations as well. So splenomegaly, of course, is a cardinal feature of liver disease, but splenomegaly will be an important feature. Amongst adults, though, um, we see alcohol-related conditions. We see fatty liver. We see a lot of patients with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, I'm told that that's a condition of epidemic proportion in the West. Uh, should we think of Gaucher? Well, a typical uh, way of investigating this is to do a fibro scan to look for early changes of fibrosis. And um, of course, they're looking for early changes indicative of cirrhosis. Um, and they'll be doing a serum ferritin, they'll be doing a serum alpha feta protein. Um, I would say to liver physicians, I would say, think about Gaucher. If you've got somebody of Jewish ancestry, think about Gaucher. If you've got any of the other features, um, of course, a gamopathy. Well, you see changes in immunoglobulin levels in cirrhosis. I've seen patients with cirrhosis who have a paraprotein, but it's unusual. So it's that constellation you've got Jewish ancestry, you've got a spleen that's perhaps bigger than you would have expected from the extent of liver disease that you've detected. Uh, you've got a very high serum ferritin. You've got Jewish ancestry. You've maybe got a, got, a, got a brother who's got Parkinson's. It's that constellation. And I hope I've just raised awareness of one of the things that the hepatologist should be thinking about. It was a surprise to us that uh, the features that we'd identified as being cardinal, major and minor signs of Gaucher disease. It was a surprise to us uh, that in terms of other cohorts, the group that were most likely to mimic Gaucher were not patients with lymphoma. They were not patients with thrombocytopenia presenting to hematologists. No, they were patients with chronic liver disease because of that constellation of abnormalities, the modest thrombocytopenia, the splenomegaly, the presence of gallstones, the presence of a gamopathy, the presence of a raised serum ferritin, they were all features that we see in Gaucher. Okay, thank you. And um, um, to finalize, yeah, the webinar, the last question is, uh, what can we do to increase the knowledge uh, and the awareness of uh, Gaucher disease? I think in Europe, I think that the Jewish community, of course, is central to this. Uh, they're very aware in London, certainly, of the conditions that their community is susceptible to. Um, they're very conscious of Tay-Sachs. Uh, you'll know that many of them do have informal arrangements for genetic screening of uh, prospective partners. Um, I would reach out to the Jewish community to think of Gaucher and to recognize that this is a treatable condition. Um, inherited conditions have a stigma attached to them. And uh, whilst appreciating that, here is a condition that is very responsive to intervention. Um, and I think, uh, broadly speaking, we should reach out to the physician community to make them aware that uh, here is a condition that's eminently treatable and it's not as rare as you think. But I would not just limit my comments to Gaucher disease. I would hope to have raised awareness of lysosomal storage disorders in general, uh, because you will be seeing these conditions. Uh, you'll be seeing patients with Fabry disease who were unrecognized. 
but now they are recognized and now they are on treatment and now we've been treating them for 15 plus years and they're still alive and so they're the overall prevalence the overall prevalence of these conditions in the community is rising because patients are living longer and they're on treatment they're diagnosed their family members are conscious of it uh, so you'll be you will be seeing people with lysosomal storage disorders okay so thank you professor meta and uh, thank to all the participants for joining us the um, we are go check webinar we hope you are able to take away uh, useful insights and to see you at our upcoming webinars so for the audience Please don't leave because uh, we are going to, la to launch a survey now and to improve our webinars and it will, will take only a few minutes. Okay, so once again, thank you and uh, have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.